we, we, we have been going through the series of uh, the book of First Peter. So we've done chapter one, chapter two, and last week our sister took us through to the end of the part three. So today we will continue uh, in chapter four. And then before we start the chapter four, you will just nice just to maybe remind some people who weren't, you know, weren't here from the beginning, but the major issues that <clears throat> she talked about in chapter three, I think uh, broadly looked at the issue of godly wives, godly husbands, the issue of submission, you know, um, and uh, also the plea for unity and love amongst God's people. Uh, we also looked at uh, the blessing that comes to those who turn away from evil and decided to do good. Okay, and um, we also looked at how to handle it when people pay you evil for good. And um, how Christ also through his suffering brought us to, to God and how Christ preached to the spirits in the prison. And lastly, you know, we, we were having about looking at the salvation of Noah as a picture of baptism as well. So broadly speaking, so that was very, very interesting chapter. We're going to have another look at those things again when we do the summary. But today we are going to go continue with chapter four. So, Chapter four, the broad summary is actually serving God in the last days. So it's, it's all about the last days. So we know that this, these last days are going to come. And uh, just a matter of uh, what we are going to do to prepare ourselves for those last days. So the general idea here is that um, we need to ask ourselves a question. Whose desire do we want to follow? Do we want to follow the desire of ourselves or do we want to follow the desire of our Lord Jesus Christ? I mean, if we can answer this question, then that will determine the direction which we take in life. Okay? And it will also depend, also, we will also be able to. Uh, decide how we are enticed by sin. The only thing we don't have to forget or take for granted is at all to, to, to think and, and say, oh, let us forget that as, as Christians, the sin will not come to us. No, sin is coming and sin is with us. Sin is around us even. So we can either draw near to God to stay clear of sin, or we can draw closer to sin and by doing that, we are, you know, staying away from God and his, all those best things that God has planned for us. So but the great news and the reassuring news is that Christ is able to give us that ability to stand firm in him. Okay? But the key is, do we want to? It's still our decision whether we want to take that opportunity or not. So the time uh, but the Apostle Peter was uh, writing, people are being slandered and taken advantage of, you know. So when such things happen to people in life, you know, they will be disillusioned. They will be, you know, sort of discouraged. So the call Peter is making in this chapter is for us to stand firm in faith and not worry about what others are doing as long as we look to Christ wholeheartedly, as far as long as our focus is in Christ. So, obviously, how are you going to defend that? Defending that is just by living a life of righteousness and demonstrating good life in Christ. That's, that's how we're going to demonstrate that. So again, this passage gives us comfort in suffering because our Lord Jesus Christ himself suffered. So we all, anytime you go through suffering, you always have to look up to Christ because he is our, you know, sort of um, benchmark for suffering. 
And when we are saying look forward to Christ, we need to remember who Christ, who, who Christ is, that he is actually God incarnate, who totally did not deserve to suffer, but suffered on our behalf. Okay, when we look at what happened on the cross, we can see that he suffered, he endured great physical, mental, spiritual pain on our behalf. Okay, and um, in so doing, he exemplified the attitude and the conduct we are to have when we are going through tough times in our lives. Yeah, so the call for us is to be prepared and equip ourselves for what lies ahead. Yeah, then we don't, we've always been repeatedly told that once you become a Christian, things are not, you know, going to be easy. You will still go through, you know, sort of difficult times in life. The enemy will try to tempt you. The enemy will try to try you to see how strong you are. So, so we must have our expectations based on, on reality and in faith. So if, if we do so, whatever comes our way, whether it is a blessing or a problem, then we can handle it with excellence, learn from it and grow from it and grow with, with it from, from that experience. I think that is what the Christian life is all about. It's all about having experiences, whether it is good or bad, you learn something, ask what, what, why has God allowed this thing to happen to me? What can I learn? How can I use it to bless another person? I think that is the way we need to be reasoning. So whenever we go through those sort of situations, let us learn from them and see how we can bless others from it. Uh, but unfortunately, we cannot do that if we're not following Christ and taking heed to his example, his grace and his love. Um, so if, we don't, if we're not doing that, sin will quickly come in again. And, and destroy everything that we have um, actually gathered. Again, one thing I need to warn you about is that this, uh, the sins of others and the sin of our heart will break us down and take us under or take us over unless we focus on our Lord Jesus Christ, his way and his path. I think that is the recommendation and that is the gold standard for us as Christians to, to, to follow. Okay, let us uh, look at the verses now one, one by one. Um, if, we, if you have your Bible, you can go with me so we can take it so from verse one to two. So the summary of this one, verse one to two, is, is telling us that in the last days, Christians should have an attitude of commitment. We need to be committed. We need to be committed. So the Bible says, say, therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, Arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. Okay? So, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. So, what are we are encouraged to do here is that the commitment God is calling for us here to, to, to be committed to is not anything greater than the commitment Jesus Christ had in enduring suffering for our salvation. So in the last days, we need to have a commitment to God that will endure us through great struggles. There will be great struggles in the last days. So if we don't have that sort of commitment, we are not going to fare very well. So we are encouraged here to, you know, have that level of commitment. Even Jesus Christ in Matthew 16, 24, communicated the same idea when he told us that anyone who would come after him must take up his cross and follow him. Okay? So, so if we look at that statement, taking up the cross means that, you know, we absolutely, we're absolutely committed and we are not going to look back. And taking up that, we know what cross, the cross means. The cross is not a place of uh, luxury. The cross is a place of suffering. So it means that as we're taking that cross, we have to be committed to, you know, this, the, the sufferings that comes with the cross. Okay. 
Okay. So again, another thing there is, is it was telling us to arm yourself with the same mind. Okay, the same mind, that mind, mind of Christ, that we are asked here to arm ourselves with the same mind. But many of us are defeated in our battle against him because we refuse to sacrifice anything in that battle. We only want victory if it comes easily to us. But Jesus called us to have the same kind of attitude that we would sacrifice in the battle against sin. Okay? So, you know, this life, sometimes, it, you know, you, you don't get anything for nothing. You know, to serve, to serve God and to follow God, there has to be some sacrifices. Okay? Many people would have to sacrifice their habits. Some people will sacrifice their lifestyle. Some people will sacrifice something, you know, that is very dear to them, a habit that they have formed. Some people might even have to sacrifice some form of addiction in order to follow Christ wholeheartedly. So what sacrifice are you making at the moment? Or what sacrifice have you, have you mapped out to make in order to follow Christ wholeheartedly? So that is an individual question for everybody to answer. So we continue. He said, he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now, what we are uh, saying there is that when a person suffers physical persecution for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, it almost always profoundly change, changes their outlook regarding sin and the pursuit of the loss of the flesh. So, that person, that one, is more likely to live the rest of his time, not for the loss of men anymore, but for the will of God. For the will of God. Once you've turned, you've turned. Okay? Yeah, Hebert did an observation that he looked at this issue of has ceased from sin. So what he's trying to, the way he's trying to describe it is that it's just like a spiritual state of the victorious sufferer. Okay? So it carries a note of triumph. So when, whenever you defeat sin, you have to be celebrated. It has to be a sort of a triumphant something, a victory. Okay? Uh, so what the explanation is that the person, that, that same person has effectively broken with a life dominated by sin. Okay? So what it means is that it doesn't mean that sin has disappeared or sin has ceased to exist, but what it means is that his old, old life that was dominated by the power of sin has been terminated. And that, that, that's a victory we always should celebrate when we conquer sin in, in any form or shape. Yeah, it doesn't mean that sin has ceased to exist. Mark that. But what it means is that that old life that was dominating you, that was dominating, you know, by that, the power of that sin has been terminated. And as far as we need to do that on a daily basis, terminating the power of sin in our lives. And that's what, that's what it means by that has ceased from sin. Yeah, it might not be a one-off event, it might be a continuous event, but we must be seen to have ceased from sin at least knowingly and unknowingly as well. So we continue. So if uh, we have not physically suffered for following Jesus Christ, we can still connect ourselves by faith to, to Jesus who has suffered for us in the flesh. So Spurgeon wrote here, he said, I beg you to remember that there is no getting quit of sin, exactly what I said before. Sin cannot cease. There is no escaping from his power, except when you are in contact with our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are united and in contact with our Lord Jesus Christ, if you put it another way, when you know Christ and follow Christ. That's about the only way you can have the power to, to break away from sin. If we Leave it to ourselves, we will fall. We will fall. We need the grace of God. Okay, we continue the statement that uh, he has no longer should live in the rest of time. He no longer should live in the rest of time. Now, here, Peter gave us two time references. 
that are helpful in having the right attitude as Christians in following our Lord Jesus Christ. The first one is the life you are living now. No longer should we, we the life we're living now, we should see it that we should not live in sin. Okay? And any time temptation or sinful impulse comes our way, we should say no longer. No longer. Remember no longer. Just tell yourself no longer will I abide by this sin. The daughter, second aspect of time also is the, the how long we have got left. How long we have got left. God has appointed us for further days in this planet Earth. So that sort of time that is left before our Lord Jesus Christ will come for the second time, you know, what, how will we account for that time? How are we going to account for that time? So these two sort of periods are very, very important for us as Christians. And uh, we need to take them seriously. Okay, let us look at verse three to six now. Verse three to six. In verse three to six, roughly what we are looking at said, so like in the last days, Christians should live with an attitude of wisdom. So let us read read it out. Um, what that verse three to six says. It says, "For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunken, drunkenness, reveries." drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but living according to God in the spirit. Okay, so look at let, let's look at this a, a little bit more closely now. You say, for we have spent enough of our past time in doing the will of Gentiles. Now, the Gentiles here, you can interpret as the world, you know, the probably the ungodly. Um, so, so Peter realized that we have spent enough time living with the world. Now, we are, now that we are called Christians, you know, we need to change. We, we don't have to live that sort of life again. Yeah, the life we have le lived as the Gentiles or in the world is a time that is, when you, when you analyze it, is actually a wasted life, okay? So it is a profound and foolish waste of the time for Christians to live like the world. And we must simply stop being double-minded, okay? And start living as Christians. Yes, that, 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 that's the thing. Um, don't procrastinate. You are going to come out today, you're going to come out tomorrow. You know, don't, don't be double-minded. Make a decision. Are you going to live like a Christian or are you going to live like the world? That's, that's, that's where we are heading. But when you actually look at what is happening, um, sadly, uh, many Christians think that they have not spent enough time doing the will of the ungodly. So they want uh, to experience more of the worldly before they make a commitment to, to, to godly, godliness. Okay, but this is a this is a tragic mistake, and um, and it takes a part that wouldn't lead them to, to eternity. It, you know, on the contrary, that part is not going to end well. So shorten the time, shorten the time you spend with the ungodly. Shorten it. Once you are a Christian. You don't have time to spend with the ungodly. The only time you are allowed to spend with the ungodly is if you're trying to bring them to Christ. So don't continue to live the same way that they are living. That is going to be a mistake. It's going to lead you away from eternal, eternal life. Please. And lewdness that they started 
the list of sins that was mentioned in that verse that we have just read. Um, and, you know, those lists, as uh, Peter has uh, listed, they mark the past life of the Christian and not the, you shouldn't mark your present life, really. It should be the things that you did before you gave your life to Christ. Okay, this lewdness means to live without any sense of moral restraint, especially when it comes to the things of sexual immorality and violence. Okay, again, if we look at the, the lewdness, the no excesses of all kinds of evil involving a lack of personal separate restraint. So this term, this picture is a sin uh, as an inordinate indulgence of appetite to the extent of violating a, a, a sense of public decency, as Hibbert has, has put it there. So when we look at that list, lewdness, loss, drunkenness, reverie, drinking parties, abominable authorities, these things have existed even during the time of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when you look at them today, they are still existing. They haven't really changed. They haven't changed. So all this time, these things have still existed. That will tell you that Satan is also as old as this list of sin. Okay? So we need to know that these things are still there. They were there 2,000 years ago. So man has really not progressed a lot when we make analysis of our sinful nature. We haven't progressed a lot. It's a, it's, a, it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy. Okay. We continue with where, where we are reading. He said, um, there's a uh, place that he said, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation. Where they are talking about the ungodly here, okay? When when the, the the world looks at our godly living, they think it is strange. Has it happened to you before? Yes, yes. On a Saturday night, everybody should be going out to be drinking and partying. You said you have a, a prayer meeting. They think you are you are strange. They think you are strange. Or on a Sunday morning, people will be going to pub to drink and eat, and you say you are going to church. They think you are strange. Okay, so so they, they, they think it's strange and that, that we are not following them in, in, in what we call this, this flood of dissipation. This flood of dissipation, the another term for it is just wastefulness. They are wasting, they are wasting. So, um, so, so really we should regard every life that was spent in the flesh to be a wasteful life. It is wasteful, has not achieved anything. Speaking evil of you, when we don't participate in the thing that the unbelievers are doing, they think we are stupid. And when we don't agree with them, they might actually turn around and start speaking evil of us. That is acceptable. You need to know that they're not, you're not singing from the same hymn book with them. Okay? Even sometimes, it doesn't matter how, how much you know God, people will still treat you with contempt and they'll be ungrateful as to what, what you did, whatever you do for them, okay? But the Bible is telling us there, I said that they will give an account to him who is ready to judge. So we don't want to come under that, that judgment. It's a warning. And I have to tell you that even somebody who have lived what you could term a good life, uh, 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 living by the world's standard and, and rules, his life would be a waste in the measure of eternity. Yes, those people who think, oh, I've had a very, very good life. But they are living worldly living. You need to understand that that sort of life is a waste when you measure it with what standard eternity wants to what you will achieve in eternity. So what that means is that you need to hang on, hang on where you are, hang on what you are doing. 
don't mind if, if the world is taking evil of you. Be focused. Keep on going where you are going. Keep on sticking to Christ. So again, we continue where we're reading. Say, for this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead. So Peter also says that because of this eternal judgment, the gospel was preached to the dead. The righteous dead know and live on a constant awareness of the reality of eternity. And are rewarded by this understanding as they live according to God in the spirit. Yeah, so there's a reference is when we as I told you before from our sister's um, doing of chapter 3, that the reference was made in uh, 1 Peter 3, 19, when Jesus preached to the spirits in the prison, preaching a message of judgment. Apparently, during the same time, Jesus also preached a message of salvation to the faithful dead in Abraham's bosom. So if you want to make reference in Luke 16, 22 for that as well. Um, so, but when we look at the issue of preaching to the dead here, it's not about a second offering them a second chance. It is what we need to have, understand it that is a completion of, of, of salvation of those who have been faithful to God under their first under the first chance. It's not not an offer of second chance on salvation. Um, and again, there are some scriptural references there that um, our Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled the promise that he would lead captivity captive. And Psalm 28, and also, uh, and he would uh, proclaim liberty to the captive and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. So these are very powerful prayer points and prayer and, and, and the verses of the Bible. When you are oppressed, when Satan is trying to sort of uh, strangle you, okay, you can, Quote that Psalm 68, 18 to proclaim that Christ have already, you know, led captivity to that to that person who is trying to, you know, to, to render you captive. They themselves have been disorganized and uh, disabled. Okay, and that our Lord Jesus Christ will proclaim liberty to the captives. He will liberate them. Whatever in your life that has hold you captive, our Lord Jesus Christ will liberate it in Jesus' name. Yeah, that thing that the enemy has held you in prison for, you will no longer be bound in the prison. You'll be liberated in Jesus' name. So let, let's look at verse 7 now. In verse 7, uh, roughly we're just going to, verse 7 is just talking about uh, in, in the last day that Christians should live with an attitude of serious prayer. Prayer is not a joke as far as uh, we Christians are concerned. We know the importance of prayer. We cannot live without prayer. Prayer is just everything for us. So really, there's nothing to tell you too much about this or to really remind you about the importance of prayer. Not even in the last days, I, I always, always. So, Verse 7 says, he said, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Simple. That one explains itself. The end of all things is at hand. If we really believe that we live in the last days, so it is all more important and appropriate that we give ourselves to prayer. Okay? Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Because you never know when our Lord Jesus Christ will come. So the assertion that the end of the ages does not indeed stand near and may break in at any time. Also, we saw that in the early churches and that belief is still valid till today. Okay. So we the issue of prayer is very, very important. We need to be serious with it. We must give ourselves to serious prayers. So as we see the weight of eternity rushing towards us, we dare not take the need of prayer lightly. We must have to take it seriously. There's something serious. And we're, we're, we're also encouraged there to be watchful in, in our prayers. So we must give ourselves to watchful prayer, primarily having our hearts and mind watching and ready for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So that is um, 
um, something that we need to be doing very well. So let us, um, verse um, 8 to 11, we will uh, look particularly, again, we're talking about the last days that Christians should live with an attitude of love. Okay? Love, we have talked a lot about love. We cannot underestimate the issue of love. Love comes above every other virtue. We are encouraged to love. So the, the, the Bible says, um, and that above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So the Bible is encouraging us there. It says, in all things, above all things, have fervent love for one another. Okay, if we cannot really underestimate the issue of love, uh, if we if we cannot love ourselves towards the end times, how how can we how do we live in eternity? So in the in in, in the light of eternity, we must have fervent love for one another uh, as brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, love covers a multitude of sin. So, love does cover a multitude of sin, both the sins of the one loving and the sins of the one who is being loved. All of them are covered by love. Okay? Um, we need to know that as Christians, uh, where love abounds in a fellowship of Christians, many small offenses and even large ones are readily overlooked and forgotten. Yes, when you love, you forget somebody, when somebody has upset you, you forget it, forget it very easily. Forget it very easily. But if love is lacking, then every word is viewed with suspicion, every action is liable to misunderstanding, and conflicts will easily spark. And when we do this, Satan is just laughing at us. Satan is laughing, Satan is happy because he has that fruit, that seed he has sown has germinated. So it's, it's not going to be our portion. Let us love. Let us love. Let us be ready to overlook things. Let us be ready to forget. Let us be ready to forgive. That is the one that we should be aiming for. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. The issue, the, the word there is a grumbling. Because you, some people might still be hospitable and then grumble over it, then it doesn't make sense. Okay? Yes, I'm going to give you a house for Bible studies, eh? but how many people are coming? I don't want too many people. Uh, ah, this child, come, come and sit there. Don't sit on that chair. Don't sit on this one. Oh, you're going to spoil my toilet, blah, blah, blah. These are all grumbling. You are, be, you are being the hospitable, but you are grumbling. It's as good as not being the hospitable to start with. So the emphasis is on the without grumbling. So obviously, without grumbling is a frank recognition that the practice of hospitality could become costly, bothersome, or irritating. Just the things I explained. Yeah, we know. We know that it can be costly. We know that it will cost you something to be hospitable. We know that you, you might get out of your comfort zone to do it. And it, certain things in the act might be irritating you. Okay? <laughs> but that is what is required in that hospitality. So we need to try to you know, ignore those areas of uh, uh, that could make us to grumble and 
focus on who we are doing this for. We are doing it for our Lord Jesus Christ. We're not doing it for the individuals that will irritate us. We're not doing it for that few pennies that it might cost us. Or neither are we doing it for the burden that it, it, it creates for us. God will repay. God will repay every act of uh, uh, hospitality directed towards his service. So the Greek word for this uh, grumbling is actually did not say muttering or a low uh, speaking as a sign of displeasure. So again, Hebert wrote there that it depicts a spirit that is the opposite of cheerfulness. Okay, when you are grumbling, you're not cheerful. And that is not good for a Christian. So we are also encouraged that as each has received the gift, minister it to one another, okay? Love shows itself as we give to the church family what God has given to us as gifts. We need, we are encouraged to share, to share that gift wholeheartedly without hiding anything, okay? That I'm teaching you today is a gift. I'm not keeping it to myself. I'm sharing it within all of us. And our sisters are praying, they're sharing it. Pastor is preaching, they're sharing it. These are all, you know, the musical people, they're sharing it. These are all gifts. And let us share it out without hesitation. And we've been encouraged also that as we do so, we are good stewards of the many, you know, faceted or manifold grace of God. So um, that manifold is many faceted, okay? grace of God that is given to us. Again, if you look at 1 Corinthians 15, 10, where Apostle Paul made it clear that, that uh, what he was, was only by the grace of God, okay? Uh, but at the same time, his grace towards me was not in vain because Paul put his own God-inspired efforts to walk with God's grace. So we need to do that as well. You know, when God has given us the grace, we put our effort in it to make it materialize. So, the, um, yeah, so the idea is that if we are bad stewards of the manifold grace of God, it is as if that grace was given to us in vain. And God forbid, we don't want that to happen. So the grace that is wasted, that grace is wasted then. So it's not going to be fruitful because it only comes to us and not through us. We need to let it go through us. Going through us means we are giving it out ourselves. So we also, the, another way to look at this uh, manifold grace is like if we want to look at it as a uh, many colored grace, uh, then you picture a ray of light that is breaking into a spray of many hues so that each of us receives God's grace at a different angle and, and flash, flash it back unbroken onto some fresh light. So just like, you know, if you look, look at a heel of light, when it hits a target, it flashes back, it dis disintegrates. So that, that's, that's, that's a way, another way for us to understand this uh, manifold grace that it can, so we describe it as a uh, multifaceted, it can also be, likened as many colored in terms of when you look at the, when the light press into many hues, okay? So that, that's the way we are supposed to be looking at it. And then we are encouraged that if anyone ministers, you know, when we are ministering, that we should um, do it with the ability which God supplies. It's only by the grace of God. Let us not take glory in it. Yes, we shall do it, uh, but we need to return all the glory to God because he is the one who started uh, doing, who gave us this, and we shall return all the glory to, to, to him. Uh, there was an, an example there for a man who was rebuilding an engine of a lawnmower. And when he finished, he thought a small part was missing, but he didn't think anything about it. Until when he wants to stop the lawnmower, it didn't stop. So then he realized that a small part, which he didn't fix, is actually of great importance. 
So that is what it is in the body of God. Everybody is important. We have to work together as a team. Without one part of the team, the whole team might not function properly. So that is the sort of a mindset that we need to have when we are doing the things of God. So as we serve one another, we do it with the strength that God provides, the ability which God supplies, so that to him we return all the glory. It's not by our own powers. It is only by the power of God that we're able to do those things. So I will um, probably stop here for tonight. We'll continue the rest of the business next week, but we can give people the opportunity to say something uh, and also maybe the opportunity for us to also pray into the, what we have studied tonight. So 